now we continue our conversation on pornography and its effects on especially our younger society as we seek to deal with this colossal paralyzing plague that faces not only families but in fact our national community and the wider international community as you would have heard from our earlier speakers. We should again thank the architects of this project, the Family Life Commission, on a stupendous effort in bringing this conversation to the fore and enlightening the national community. Our next topic is brain drain neurological considerations of porn addiction. And it will be delivered by nothing short of an agile mind. I'll tell you why. He is a neurosurgeon in San Antonio, Texas, a clinical associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center and serves as director of the Spine Fellowship at the Medical School Program. He is also director of neurological, neurosurgical training for the residency program at the Methodist Hospital Rotation. He is currently listed in Best Doctors in America. He's a member of Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society and is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. He has recently authored and co-authored several papers on addiction in peer-reviewed journals. One is titled, Pornography Addiction, a supranormal stimulus considered in the context of neuroplasticity. And the other is a peer-reviewed rebuttal to the Steel 8 Owl paper reportedly refuting the addiction mode. It is titled, High Desire or Merely an Addiction? That's the question. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for us to have with us today, and I now invite him to deliver his address, Dr. Donald Hilton. Thank you. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to be with you and, and your beautiful country here. So, can pornography become a brain drug? And if so, can it change the brain? Now, the answer is yes, and we're going to talk a little bit about why. And I'd like to use an illustration. We live in a different world, and things have changed. And uh, we all know that, but with regard to pornography, things have changed. It's not just a centerfold from the mid-1950s anymore. You see, for instance, as we go back to this picture, on the far left, you see the spindle top gusher of 1900 in East Texas, near where I was born. Uh, this, this black stuff came out of the ground. They made gasoline out of it. Henry Ford invented a car because of that. Uh, we have flight. We have light bulbs. We have this thing called a computer with Bill Gates there in the middle, a uh, man on the moon, of course. Everything changed, and of course, on the bottom right is the Archie Query Forum. It was the first search engine in the early 90s, where journalists decided, rather than having to call each other, mail each other different presentations, let's have our computers connect and talk to each other. Novel idea. Google being everything. And now we have this little guy here which has changed everything, hasn't it? It's essentially walking around with whatever we want to know, good or harmful as well. And every 12, 14-year-old can walk around with the same thing. It essentially, if you think about it, is a mirror. It mirrors back to us exactly what we want. And in doing so, sculpts what we want next. Now this is uh, an experience that I had a number of years ago. 35 years ago, before I was a doctor, I was a missionary in Africa for a couple of years, in South Africa. Loved the country, still have friends there. A few years ago, we visited again with my family, and while there, we went on a safari. We went up to Victoria Falls. I actually took this picture as we flew over Victoria Falls. Um, and uh, you can see the, the mist coming out. That's the Zambezi River. We stayed in a safari camp on the Zambezi. Uh, this um, hippo, they actually would hang out right off the bank. They called him Humphreys. They said, don't pet him. Um, and if you look on the far bank, you see this grass. This grass stands about 8 to 10 feet high. And 
we went on game drives. As we went on these game drives, we were in open-air Land Rovers with no doors and no windows. The rule was that the animals had this kind of truce, where as long as you sat still in the Land Rover and didn't move, the animal would look at you as a big, smelly, oily-looking animal thing, and it wouldn't pay any attention, literally. You could be 10 feet from a lion, it would just look at you, you hoped. <clears throat> and, uh, and so the rule was you didn't get out of the Land Rover. If you did, the rules changed, suddenly became more interesting. So one day, our ranger said, let's go to the adrenaline grass. And I said, why do you call it that? And he said, you will see. So we drove around the adrenaline grass, and again, no doors, no windows. And as we're driving around, he stopped, and he said, do you see it? And I went back and took this picture later, and I said, do, do I see what? No, and no one in the car saw it. And then the next picture is what we saw. Now, okay, if you go back, you can see that it was there. Let's see, back, back one slide. Go back one slide if you would. Um, you, you, in the other slide, you can actually see the paw and the, and the, and the leg just kind of laying there when you see the other picture. Um, but I, I'll tell you, when we saw this picture, everyone's heart pounded out of their chest. And I said, I get it, adrenaline, got it. I understand what you were saying about the adrenaline grass. And so this adrenaline thing is real. Now, I want you to notice as well, when you saw that lion, you noticed that he was really looking at us. He was intent. He was focused. It was a she, actually. He was very focused on us. And that was dopamine. Dopamine is the wanted chemical in our brain. It made that lion interested in us and, frankly, us very interested in the lion. We were both looking at each other with a lot of interest. Our daughter actually moved in her seat. She was about 12. Now, the guy has a gun, but when she moved in her seat, the lion jumped on its feet. Now, the guy with the gun is ready to go, but thinking, hmm, lion jump speed, human movement speed. Hmm, doesn't look too good. So the lion walked around our Land Rover, locked and loaded on us, looking the whole time, goes back, plops down, and goes to sleep. And my heart was about to explode. I said, wham, wham. I said, adrenaline, I get it. I'll never, I'll never doubt you again. So my brain was really good at making adrenaline. Well, adrenaline is a very close cousin of what's called dopamine. Dopamine. Dopamine is a uh, a wanted chemical in our brain. So first of all, I'll talk about the brain. Frontal lobe is your thinking brain. Brainstem is part of your wanting brain. You have a thinking brain, you have a wanting brain. The wanting brain just says, just do it. Quit arguing. It feels good, so eat it, use it, do it, sleep with it. It doesn't matter. It just feels good, so do it. The thinking brain says, Maybe, but you have to give it some thought because there are consequences to just doing it. So there's this tussle. In between those two areas is, keep going, ah, okay, that's focus. Okay, that's me looking at someone's spinal cord. I'm very focused. Um, that's me, chocolate brownies, you're all focused on that. Right? Two birds mating. It's all dopamine. That's the, that's the chemical. Now, dopamine is only one little carbon, three hydrogens different from uh, dope, uh, from uh, adrenaline. They're close cousins. They're arousal neurotransmitters in our brain. Next, please. And so what happens then is the brain, so this frontal, this, this reward area is in the center of our brain, and you can go to the next slide, and it's a tussle, constant tussle. See that VTA? That VTA is the ventral tegmental area, and that produces dopamine. Now notice over to your left is NCA, bottom left, NCA is basically the nucleus accumbens, and then PFC is the prefrontal cortex. That's the, uh, the judgment part of your brain. Notice that that NCA is kind of trapped between those two areas. Do it, think about it. Do it, think about it. So that reward center is being constantly squeezed. Next, please. And natural rewards can actually affect the brain very powerfully. So the dopamine spikes in that reward area. Look at that, almost 1,000% with amphetamine, cocaine, 350, nicotine, 200, morphine, over 200% spike. Next slide, please. What about natural rewards like food and sex? Can they do the same thing? They can and they do do the same thing. Food and sex also affect the brain rewards very powerfully. Notice that sex, 200% equivalent to morphine. Very powerful natural reward in the brain. Next, please. 
And it's in our DNA. Our DNA basically not only makes us look like ourselves, but it drives how we want what we think. DNA drives that. And when we want something, there are chemical engines of desire that are mobilized with DNA. This is actually at the top left Francis Crick's description of what he thought DNA would look like back in the 50s based on X-ray diffraction. And in 2012, electron micrograph photographed an actual DNA strand. 50 years later, looking and saying, yep, that's what it looks like. Next, please. I was honored to be part of this paper published in the National Academy of Sciences looking at the fact that the same DNA uh, sequences in our brain that make us crave natural addiction, uh, natural substances, for instance, salt craving in animals is an animal study, are the same DNA engines that cause us to crave drugs when we're addicted. That had never been shown. Our paper published in the National Academy of Sciences, it was Melbourne University and Duke University, and, and I was involved. And Wolfgang Litsky, who wrote it, said that basically addiction usurps these natural pleasure areas. It takes over. Next, please. As National Geographic wrote an article about our paper and said, cocaine addiction uses the same brain paths as salt cravings. Drugs hijack instinctual need for salt. Next, please. Delta Vos B is one of those switches. It's one of those brain chemicals formed, and it's important as what a immediate, immediate, uh, a uh, intermediate signal cascade in addiction. It's higher in addicted animals, and now we found that it's also present in humans. We thought it would be. We confirm that next. John Leaf talks about how we think a thought occurs. He says, and DNA, RNA, all these chemical chains start. And what happens from that is because we think or want something. The brain builds new roads, physical new roads, new dendrites, new axons, new bridges called microtubules that connect brain cells that were not connected before we thought the thought. Literally builds new bridges in the brain. And a mental event, as he said, has triggered an enormous molecular cascade. Next, please. And looking at, at cocaine, you see the, the on the left is a brain wire connecting two brain cells. On the right is a brain wire addicted to cocaine. See all the little arborizations? Except this isn't cocaine. That was the first one. It's been found with severe salt craving, as in the study we looked at, and more recently in an animal model, with sex. Sex is a powerful invoker of neuroplasticity. So it's a very powerful learning uh, model. Next. Is the brain then changeable? Or is it ceramic? Is our, is our brain fired when we're adults and we can't change it? Or does it change when we learn? It changes. It is plastic. And in fact, we've seen with music, when violin players play instruments and we scan their brain, we find that the part of the brain that controls that string hand gets bigger, and the more the person plays and the earlier they start, the bigger it gets. Medical students, when studied before and after a three-month period of intense studying, we found that the brain enlarges and actually gets bigger. So it changes with learning. Learning changes the brain. We've known this for 20 years now. The brain, in other words, is the source of behavior, but in turn is modified by the behaviors it produces, learning, sculpts, brain structure. Next. Mark Lewis was addicted to just about every drug, and he then became a neuroscientist, sobered up, and wrote this book, New York Times bestseller, great book. I encourage you to read it. it talks about dopamine, the chemical mover that gets us to chase whatever it is we want, whatever spells relief. For starving animals, dopamine makes the brain a vehicle for seeking food for addicts. It sends the brain hunting for drugs. In fact, dopamine power desperation can change the brain forever because its message of intense wanting narrows the field of synaptic change, focusing it like a powerful microscope on one particular reward. Whether in the service of food or heroin, love, and we could say sex here, there's a difference, but in this context, it's a, a romantic reward, it could be sex, or gambling. Dopamine forms a rut, a line of footprints in the neural flesh, and those footprints harden and become indelible, beating an intractable path to a highly specialized and limited pot of gold. Addiction, then, represents a pathological yet powerful form of learning and memory, as Cowher and Malink at Stanford said. And we've seen that addiction has a learning footprint, too. It causes shrinkage in those reward areas as opposed to other learning activities which cause enlargement. And this particular footprint for addictive learning has been seen with cocaine, methamphetamine, numerous drug addictions, and natural addictions as well. 
And yes, in 2014, pornography was found to look very similar to other addictions in causing shrinkage. So can, this is a study published in 2014 by uh, Kuhn and Galette out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany, showing that yes, pornography does cause shrinkage in the reward area of the brain. The more hours per week viewed, the more the shrinkage is pronounced. And it also causes problems with the frontal connectivity, the ability of the brain to talk to that frontal lobe. The break of the brain, in other words, is wounded, is hurt. It can't stop the behavior. It can't weigh the behavior as much. And in other, this is a study that correlates with that, published in the Journal of Sex Research, finding that pornography impairs working memory function. People can't remember as well. They're more clouded. Um, the cognitive brain, this is a, a paper sub-published in Socioaffective Neuroscience by Georgiadatis, finding that, yes, in, in sexuality, even normal sexuality, the thinking brain turns off and the wanting brain turns on, and that makes sense. That's great. That's what sexuality is for at any appropriate time and place. Um, and so during orgasm, it actually peaks, and it pretty much shuts off the thinking brain. You know, if someone doesn't believe that, then when they're having sexual relations, try to work a complex algebra problem. It doesn't work, I promise you. Next, please. Um, and as this guy found out, uh, it doesn't work with driving either. Next. At the office, this is scary. This is Federal Communications, Treasury, Department of Treasury, National Science Foundation, filled with U.S. employees watching porn at work. How much does that cost us? A lot. Next. Okay, and it basically this whole thing of, the, of sex shutting the brain, that thinking brain down, turkeys. Anyone ever hunted? You guys have turkeys. In, in America, they hunt turkeys. And people that hunt turkeys, the way they get, I like the males, the males are bigger, they use a turkey call. And the male comes running in because it's a female, and he thinks, ah, oh, I'm in a mate. So he goes running towards the sound, and lo and behold, it's someone with a 12 gauge shotgun, and the idea is to shoot their head off. And that's what happens. They shoot the head off. But, next please. It works with people, too. The honeypot ploy is used by spy agencies. Remember Matahari? Used the pretty female to lure the unsuspecting male, shut down his frontal lobe so he's not thinking, and you've got him. Uh, Mordecai Avananu. The Israelis uh, got him once because the, the Mossad wanted him. He did, I don't remember what he did. He did something they didn't like. They wanted him to the point. So they used a female Mossad agent. He goes running into the apartment looking for the romantic liaison like the turkey, hearing the turkey call and meet the Mossad agent. Next. So, Voon, out of Cambridge University, I talked about how the brain shrinks with porn. She looked at a study. What about incentive sensitization? We know, for instance, that when we show someone with cocaine addiction, cocaine cues, white lines, the nucleus accumbens, that area of their brain that processes rewards, spikes more than a person that's not addicted. It's called incentive sensitization. It's a sign of addiction. And lo and behold, in this study out of Cambridge University, published two years ago, same thing. It showed with individuals sensitized to porn, with porn addiction, that they, their, uh, their nucleus accumbens spiked in a similar way. So what happens then? How, how does this affect things? How does this affect behavior? Nicholas Tinbergen won the Nobel Prize in, in the 1970s. He was a behavioral biologist. And he invented a tree, he coined a term called a supranormal stimulus. What he did is he painted bird eggs bigger and brighter than a normal bird's eggs, plaster eggs, and he found that the birds, when presented with their normal, smaller, duller eggs and these big, beautiful plaster fake eggs, would ignore their own eggs and try to roost and nest and hatch the plaster fake eggs. We think, well, that's really stupid. And then he took butterflies, a species of male butterfly where the male is attracted to the female based on the shape and size of her wings and he made these cardboard fake butterfly wings and he gave the males access to the real females and to the cardboard females and guess what? The male butterflies ignored the real females and they tried to mount and mate the cardboard females. Does that sound familiar? Today? If we think about that, it's really very similar. And I actually wrote a paper about this. If you Google my name, uh, uh, Pornography Addiction Supernormal Simulus, you'll get that paper. Effective neuroscience. Next, please. Moths. We brought gypsy moths to North America in the, the mid-1800s, thinking they make really good silk, right? And they also eat our forests, and we've been trying to kill them ever since. And the most effective thing is pheromones. You take 
The males find the females by scent in these gypsy moths. So you take these little plastic pellets embedded with the scent of a female gypsy moth. We can't smell them, but the males are so overpowered that they can't find the females. So it's called a pheromone. Next, please. The male does, becomes confused and doesn't know which direction to turn for the female or becomes desensitized to the lower levels of pheromones naturally given out by the female and has no incentive to mate with her. Sound familiar? It's happening today as well. Now, we talk about porn creating aggression. It does in some, but it also in some creates total apathy. In Japan, there's millions of young, uh, America, or, uh, young Japanese males who are basically staying at home and masturbating to porn. That's their sex partner. And essentially, then, they become sensitized to where if they hear a computer humming, that's sex. Interesting study looking at rats a number of years ago. Cadaverine is the smell that makes a dead body smell bad. It's really horrible. They took concentrated cadaverine, and even rats who like bad smells, they hate cadaverine. They'll run from it. What they did, though, is they took these naive rats that were sexually naive, and every time they were exposed to a virgin, to these virgin rats who were exposed for sex, uh, they take the new virgin and expose them to sex, they would associate it with cadaverine. They would put cadaverine on the female. So sex was always with cadaverine. And they found that the normal male, if you put a, 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 a male rat who had never uh, been exposed to that and you expose him to cadaverine, he would run. But if you just put cadaverine in his cage, he would run. But if it's associated with sex, then he actually, when you just place cadaverine alone, he would try to bite the wooden paddle that the cadaverine was on because he associated it with sex. And the rat liked the cadaverine because it meant sex. It's called sculpting. It's called association. It's called imprinting. And pornography does that very well. Next. Mirror neurons. Sharon Cooper talked about those. They're areas of our brain that project us into what we're watching. They do it very powerful, powerfully. Maras published a study out of France looking at individuals, uh, looking at pornography, and found that when you look at their mirror systems, they are powerfully turned on. We suggest that the mirror neuron system prompts the observers to resonate with the motivational state of other individuals appearing in visual depictions of sexual interactions. What motivational state are they resonating with? What is the motivational state of the performers in the movies? This is Bill Margle. I've edited this comment. Uh, I, I'm not going to share the full comment today, but the, the, this one's bad enough. He said, I'd really like to show what I believe the men want to see, violence against women. I firmly believe we serve a purpose in showing that. And Bill did his job very well. Um, and this is a study, Nana Bridges, uh, looking, basically showing that the top most popular porn movies, about 90% of the scenes, show this aggression. Verb, verbal aggression, physical aggression towards women. And it's not surprising. Remember, arousal helps us learn. Sharon talked about that. Marianne's talked about that. Um, sex is a progression from emotional inception to autonomic arousal. It's always done prone to sympathetic, it's always prone to sympathetic overshoot. Catecholamines tend to dominate. So aggression is the end game of autonomic sympathetic arousal. What does that say? It says that sex is very prone to aggression if it's not boundary. Now, the pro-porn folks will say, I don't have time to talk about this, it's a whole other lecture. They'll say, hey, higher the porn rate goes, the lower the rape rate goes. I don't think anyone believes that anymore. But Corey Young wrote this study in the Iowa, Iowa Law Review instead of and found that actually rape rates are skyrocketing right now when you look at how police departments are purposefully not reporting rapes that you're actually about a million rapes short of full vaginal rapes. He said instead of experiencing the widely reported great decline in rape, America's in the midst of a hidden rape crisis. So this aggression thing. Um, just one study, there's many studies that show, yes, it does increase attitudes of aggression. I'm just going to show this one. We could go on and on with these studies, John Fobert and many others next. Porn-induced sexual dysfunction. I mentioned that earlier. Um, Sharon talked about it, Marianne talked about it earlier in her talk. Uh, Abraham Mortenauger at Harvard said, yep, it's real. Porn is causing impotence. Used to be, what, 2 to 3% of young men in, under 30. Now it's getting up to 20, 30%. Next. Uh, Harry Fish, Cornell urologist, said the same thing. Porn is harming every aspect of sexual health. Next. 
The study was published by Andrew Doan out of the military. Is internet pornography causing sexual dysfunctions with rates up to 30% now? And this is porn induced. What about neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity, I talked about how learning changes our brain. What about multimodal learning? What is that? Well, if someone has a stroke, if you go to rehab, they'll do a lot of things to help them start moving that limb again, or starting to improve their attitude again. They'll have music. They'll have water therapy. They'll do um, stories. They'll do uh, a lot of different things to help stimulate different sensory inputs to the brain. And we found that learning works much better if we do sensory inputs. Music, for instance, speaking, if I talk like this at the same time, in a monotone voice and talk the whole time. You know, essentially, you'll be even more asleep than you are right now. But if I move my hands, if I talk, it's been found that hand gestures helps us look. That's multimodal neuroplasticity. That's what's happening there. And it works with, it's been, it's been seen in many modalities. Well, and that's great. Music, meditation, mindfulness therapy, it works both ways. Next, porn is now going VR, virtual reality porn. Put on a headset everywhere you look when you have a virtual head. Anyone worn a, has anyone worn a virtual reality headset? It's amazing. We had one last week at our, uh, our, in our uh, conference that uh, we had in Houston. And uh, it, was, it can be used for the good, too. It doesn't mean the technology is bad. The technology is fantastic. But the dark side is powerful because it essentially puts the person in the porn room with the person. And with haptic technology, they're interacting with a computer-filmed person. So it's like, as some of these folks are proud, it says, virtual reality porn make 2D porn obsolete. Men will never have to leave their computers. Um, and Facebook just purchased... Uh, Oculus Rift, and many industry insiders say that they're going to pay for it uh, with virtual reality. In other words, virtual reality porn will be financed by virtual reality headsets, and the technology of virtual reality will be financed by porn. It's going to take porn to do it. Gaming is the ostensible reason for it, and, and you know, interaction. It has great uses. I mean, surgical modeling, um, you know, using it for pilots to train. You can see all the, the wonderful applications, but porn is going to really dominate this industry. So ASAM has redefined, based on the science I've showed you, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, comprised of medical doctors who actually treat addiction, not only treat it with counseling, but you have to be, to be ASAM, you have to be able to prescribe medicine, uh, you have to be able to treat uh, alcoholic withdrawal, you have to be able to treat uh, seizures with uh, alcoholism, with narcotic overdose, etc. So you have to be able to prescribe medicine. So these are very biologically based individuals. And so they, the, the doctors of ASAM, based on this new neuroscience that I've been talking to you about, redefined addiction in 2011. Number one, they said it's a chronic disease. Now remember, it's a disease of learning. It's a disease of learning. Of the brain affecting reward, motivation, and memory. Those three systems. And for the first time, ASAM said, and it doesn't matter whether it's a substance or behavior, it affects the same brain pathways. In other words, it's time to drop the S on addictions. It's addiction. The disease is addiction. Cocaine, porn, it does not matter. The brain doesn't know the difference. Yeah, meth gets you there quicker with that 1,000% spike, but porn will get you there too. And it's being recognized. I was honored to be a part of this project. This is a uh, medical textbook that was just published a few months ago by Oxford University Press. Uh, Alan Swan at Baylor College of Medicine uh, published this. was the editor of this, along with some others. Uh, he's at the Menninger Institute in Houston. And uh, the one, Mark Potenza is one of the, uh, he's at Yale University and is one of the individuals who uh, looked at getting gambling in the DSM-5 as an actual behavioral addiction. First time the DSM's ever recognized that. And he actually commented on our chapter at, at the bottom, neurobiology, behavioral addictions, sexual addiction. I was honored to be asked to write the chapter in this book. And basically, the idea that sexuality can become a brain addiction is being accepted. This is for doctors. This is a psychiatric textbook for use in medical schools and teaching doctors. So I'm encouraged that it's moving this way. Next so I'll just leave you with a, a story here, a couple of short stories. Um, I was recently working, uh, finishing a case in, in, my, in, a, in, a, in a room, an operative. It was actually a spine case. And 
anesthesiologist came in and said, um, are you about done? I said, I am. I said, we need your help in the next room. We're bringing, it turns out that one of my partners who was out of town had done a brain surgery on a woman. She'd done really well, was about to go home the next day. But she had problems with her blood, and so the platelets in her blood would tend to crash. Out of nowhere, a week post-op, when you would never expect it, she developed this horrible brain hemorrhage in the bottom of the brain, that bottom area in the back. You see that little thing that looks like a cauliflower? Does it look like she's like a cauliflower? It actually does in real life, too. I shouldn't say it. <laughs> um, it, it really does. It looks just like a cauliflower. It has a little ridges on it. So that's called the cerebellum. It's the balanced part of the brain. But right under it is that kind of tube thing. That's the brain stem. And if you push on the brain stem too hard, it's coma country. And, and people go into a coma. And that's what was happening is this woman was about to go home, and suddenly they said she quit moving, she quit talking. And she was up there, and here the surgeon that did the surgery was out of town. So my partner was covering. He was just finishing a case next door. And he said, they came in and said, hey, could you help? We need to get this going. So the two of us uh, for our partner took her back into surgery emergently. I saw her right before she went back. There was nothing there. She was in a deep coma. She would not arouse, not respond to anything. She was dying, and it wouldn't be very long. We took her back. We reopened. We went right up into that cerebellar region. We removed the tumor, uh, removed the, sorry, the, uh, the, the blood clot, and we got the scope, and in looking around, I could see the brain stem. I could see uh, areas that were important in reward, areas that were important in arousal, all these areas we've been talking about. And uh, I could see them again. And so the brain was tight. It came out at us, just swollen when we started. If we took the brain, it relaxed. When we finished, it was pulsing nicely. It was relaxed. Uh, she woke up, fortunately. Uh, a few days ago, I had the opportunity to stop by. I never actually got to meet her before. And I was up rounding on someone else. And I went, I'm going to go see how. I'd heard she had done well, thank goodness. And I went by, and I met this person. And it was remarkable. She looked at me. She talked. She got emotional. We visited. We connected as human beings. I thought, you know, in a sense, metaphorically, that's what porn can do, can't it? It can actually take our humanity away. It can put us into an emotional coma. It can take away that connection, the ability to really be human. And yet there can be recovery. And people that were emotionally comatose can change, can come back, and can become human again. I'll close with this story. I was, uh, next one, I was in Washington. I was with actually Don and, and Marianne. We were in a press conference. You remember that press conference here? And it was in the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And as I was walking down the hall, I saw this photograph on the wall. And I was about to go speak in Des Moines at a medical school. And so this happened in Des Moines. And I just became fascinated with this picture, just literally walking down the hall. And I said, I don't know what this is, but this is going to be something. As I looked at it and I learned about what happened, it turns out that Ralph and Patricia Neely were in a boat on the Des Moines River in, uh, in, uh, right in Des Moines, Iowa. They were looking for a place where they could watch the 4th of July fireworks the next day with their family. The, they were in a little motorboat and the motor went out. Horrified onlookers on the side of the river watched as that boat without its engine went over a waterfall. They saw Alan hand Patricia the only life vest in the boat as it went over the water. Alan sadly lost his life. Patricia clung to the life, boat, uh, life jacket and was swirling in the water, trapped at the bottom of the falls. Several people tried to rescue her. They had rescue crews, arms of life. They could not reach her. It looked hopeless, and this gathering crowd watched this tragedy unfold in horror. Now, Jason Oglesby was not a rescue worker. He was a construction worker. And he watched this, and as he did, he realized, we're building a building, we've got a crane. So he took it upon himself to wrap his construction chain around him and to lower him in the water. And he reached down, and he lifted Patricia out of that water and saved her life. And Mary Chine, for the Des Moines News, happened to be watching and snapped this photograph. You can see why it won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. I believe this is what we're about. I think this is what our brains are for, what our humanity is all about. It's not about using and abusing. It's about feeling, loving, and helping. I think we can do better. This is really who we are. Thank you.